Hey everyone, my name is Ajay and uh, in this series we are going to talk about the SD-WAN. In this agenda, we are going to cover what are the challenges we see with the traditional WAN versus the benefit we are going to get out of the SD-WAN technology. Same time, we are also going to review the return of investment while putting these devices into the production and replacing your legacy environment. We're also going to take a look on the connectivity type available in the market. And uh, we're also going to talk about the DMBPN. And uh, the reason behind talking the DMBPN since the SD-WAN technology is something based, which is based on the DMBPN concept what we implemented a couple of years ago. So let's get started. So today's one business challenges. So when we look at the business challenges, first thing comes in our mind as very complex operations. And today's ban environment as an insufficient bandwidth utilization, limited scale. You definitely have the fragmented security and the devices what we use have a limited capacity of the application awareness then you're going to have the higher cost all these things contribute to overall complexity of one network when we talk about the traditional network technical challenges few things we will notice so your control plane and the data plane are sitting on the same box. So let's talk about the Cisco router where you have your data plane and your control plane, which is sitting on the same box. Peer to peer control plane. So when you talk about control plane, you need to configure all these devices to talk to each other to build the routing table. And this routing table protocol, they have to pop, like uh, get propagated to all the peers participating in the network design or a build. Localized management. So localized management is something, let's say tomorrow you want to configure a new network and which you want to propagate to the rest of the site. So you need to get into the box which is locally managed. Maybe you do the SSH or do the console to get into the box and do everything in terms of the configuration. Complex to manage. So complexity with all these feature complexity comes automatically into the picture. You want to simply advertise a small network, but due to the complexity, you need to manage the rest of the peers. You need to make configuration on rest of the peers as well. So small, small changes, but you need to do it all over the place. Not scalable. Should we talk about it? The scalability is going to be a limitation. And it is almost impossible to support multiple transport. And whenever you have a kind of the link down scenario, you are going to see the route is from all over the place. So let's talk about scalability. On right hand side, this is a diagram where you have four routers, one, two, three, and four marked in the red color. And you have internet connectivity where you want to do some sort of, let's say the IPsec or the GRE. So your network diagram will look like this. You need to configure all the peers and let's say this is ready-made. This is up and working. And suddenly you come up with a new branch or maybe new office. So the configuration wise, you need to make changes on rest of the peers, including this box. So your tunnel, IP, IPsec tunnel will look like one, two, three, and the four. 
So you added one router, but ultimately you are going to configure five different routers to make it work. Hence, it adds the complexity into the network from the management point of view. In your enterprise network, or maybe when we talk about the data center network, this is a very common term, which is MPLS. So MPLS is private network managed by your service provider. So in this network, you can see this is a P router, which is called the provider edge. All the connections which comes from the customer end, they are going to be terminated on the P. And then you have the provider routers. Those are nominated with the P1, P2, and P3. And then you have a customer edge router where you might be running some sort of the routing protocol with your P router. Then you have a C router, which is your customer router. So this is a backbone which is managed by service provider. And as a customer, you connect to these edges. Why do we want to use MPLS? As I mentioned, this is a dedicated environment. Your service provider, they are going to offer you some sort of the SLA. Maybe you want to run some voice traffic so they can go and start marking your traffic for a committed SLA, which you might get. And uh, obviously the bandwidth is going to be dedicated. Whatever you buy, you are going to get that all the time. The second type of connectivity which is available and that is very, very cheap is going to be the internet. On my screen, you can see this is a submarine cable map where these submarine cables, they connect between the continents. So our internet traffic goes over these cables. That's one type of connectivity. And then when it comes to your branches, maybe your data center or maybe your home network, there are multiple options are available. So those options can be the kind of the broadband. So first option is the DSL. Second option can be the cable modem. Third option can be as a fiber to home or maybe fiber to the location. The fourth option is going to be the wireless and fifth option is going to be the satellite. So here on the screen, you can see there's a satellite connection. Maybe you have, you have some smaller dish antennas installed on your roof, and those are connecting to some sort of the earth station. And then in the back end, you have some fiber connectivity to the internet. Obviously not to forget, there's a new type of broadband which is also available, which is broadband over the power lines. So let's talk about the ROI. So this is the calculation and the snapshot which I have taken it from the Cisco website and it does talks about the five year circuit return of investment from the SD-WAN technology. So it is this model is based on typical MPLS to hybrid band uh, migration. So when we say, let's say as a customer, you have multiple MPLS circuit installed. And when we talk about the hybrid technology, it means there's going to be one circuit from the MPLS provider. Another circuit, you are going to move it to your internet provider, which is going to be much cheaper in terms of the cost. So I have chosen a region, which is the Asia Pacific. And as a customer, I have 50 size and every site I'm going to have the 10 Mbps connectivity on the links. So traditionally, as a customer, I had to spend 3.5 million dollars. And after doing this sort of migration, my cost become 1.3 million. So overall reduction in terms of the cost is going to be 63%. So van cost. So van cost. This is the cost calculation I have taken it for the Tata communication and your MPLS circuit cost, which is based on the BPN bandwidth, one-time installation, 
third party loop charges at actual and some miscellaneous charges so if i look at the 10 mbps cost it is going to be somewhere between this similarly if i go for a another service provider which is going to be the airtel and minimum speed they're offering is a 40 mbps my cost is very less is 499 rupees only so the benefit from sd when i'm going to have a lot of bandwidth available and the same sort of the reliability from mpls what i used to get earlier i can still get and guarantee that with lower price let's talk about the dmvpn now so there were technically three phases phase one phase two and phase three and the fourth phase they come up with some a technology called which is a flex vpn and that was introduced with the brf support so in phase one it is going to be a straightforward hub to spoke connectivity in a phase two they try to build those dynamic tunnel from spoke to spoke and there was some scalability issues which they resolved in the phase three and phase four as i mentioned they introduced uh, ike v2 along with the brf support let's talk about the phase one as i mentioned earlier it is going to be a technology where you are going to use the gre with the ipsec and obviously you are going to have one router which is going to play a role of the hub so summarization of the route it can happen on the hub and all the traffic from one spoke to another spoke it is routed by the hub so let's see the in the animation how it looks like my first packet it goes through hub and hub look at the routing table and routes back to the spoke too in phase two cisco tried to build these spoke to spoke connections directly however there were some limitations so let's look at the animation and try to understand what was the problem here which we solved in the phase three so my first packet it reaches to the hub very similar to the phase one then goes back to the spoke two however the next packet it can reach directly from spoke one to spoke two let's talk about the phase three in the next slide in the phase three spoke to spoke tunnels can be built directly so i don't need to route those traffic from the hub so this is very very straightforward which resolved over scalability and the management issue Thank you and I will see you in the next video which is going to be the part 2.